Hello, and welcome again to MBS History. And as you can see by the title, this episode is going to be on the curious case of Princess Stephanie von Hohenlohe, a Jewish princess who was also personal friends with Adolf Hitler and a Nazi spy. You're probably a bit curious by all of this. It seems almost impossible to hear, but yes, she was greatly influential. And... Um, I don't think a lot of people are aware of her. She brushed shoulders with most of the richest and most influential men of the day. She was somewhat of a James Bond-like figure, sleeping her way into influencing certain things. And she was responsible for, um, let's see, meetings between Chamberlain and Hitler. She was responsible for the Sudetenland being taken. She was responsible for lifting up Nazi groups within England and the United States. And she was followed by MI6, MI5, French Intelligence Service, and the FBI. So if you haven't already, please like and subscribe because we are a small channel and we're looking to grow. And without further ado, I will try and summarize oh, an article, mind you, I want to give credit where it's due, that was written by John Simpkin over at Spartacus Education. I'm going to try and do this on the spot. This isn't scripted. I'm going to be summarizing about three different articles. And I'm going to try and do this in, ki in a concisive order, but, uh, you know, bear with me. Without further ado, let's start this. Okay. So Stephanie, we'll call her just Princess Stephanie for this point. Stephanie was born the daughter of Johann Sebastian Richter and Ludmilla Karanda, a Jewish woman from Prague. She was born the 16th of September, 1891 in Vienna. According to her half-sister, uh, Gina Kaus, her real father was Max Wiener, a Jewish moneylender. In the book, as you probably see, I think I have it up, by Martha Schaud, the author of Hitler's Spy Princess, it was pointed out while Richter was serving a seven-month prison sentence for embezzlement, his wife had a relationship with Wiener. So there you go. That gives you a little tidbit of what was going on there. Stephanie did not enjoy her early education. School was something of a trial because, as she says, I was erratic pupil, abysmally poor at mathematics. For some reason, I excelled at physics. My good points were history and physical education. At the age of 15, she was enrolled in the Ballet School of Vienna Court Opera, where later she wrote, by the age of 16, I had something of a reputation as a beauty. She is quite the narcissist. And she was sent to college in Eastbourne to learn English. Stephanie had a talent for languages. By the age of 21, she spoke several fluently. So in 1913, Stephanie had an affair with the married Archduke Franz Salvatore, Prince of Tuscany. I believe I do have a picture. There we are. Charming man. Looks. Those glasses. Oof. He was the son-in-law of Emperor Franz Joseph I. She was having a sexual relationship also with Prince Friedrich Franz von Lohenhohen, Waldenburg Schlingsfest. When she became pregnant with Salvatore's baby, she convinced Friedrich that it was his child. They married the 12th of May, 1914, giving her the title of Princess, which she used the rest of her life. Seven months after the wedding, she gave birth to a son, Prince von Lohenhohen, Walding Schlingsfest. So I'm going to try and skip past a lot of this because this is a 40-page um, article. Princess Stephanie goes into World War I. She volunteers as a nurse on the Eastern Front uh, where she's accompanied by her, her butler and chambermaid. Um, I'm, you know, commendable, very commendable. After the war, she is being noted by people to be cunning, opportunistic, radiating personality and charm, a princess of fascinating figure. It was not just her title and her confidence that impressed, it was her daring way that she behaved. Few aristocratic titled ladies in society had the nerve to openly smoke Havana cigars as Stephanie did. Boy, oh boy, that would, that would really piss Sigmund Freud off. He did not like women smoking cigars like that. I deter from this. In 1922, she moved to Nice, where she began a relationship with Hugh Grosvenor, the second Duke of Westminster. She became also friendly with John Warden, an immensely rich American businessman from the Standard Oil family. A lot of money there. 1925, she took an exclusive apartment 
45th Avenue of George the fifth in Paris, where she employed a household staff of servants and so on. So, so, you know, she has the title of princess and she uses this for the rest of her life. And she lives a very, very nice life. Now, 1927, Monte Carlo, she meets Lord Rothermore, an owner of several newspapers. His personal wealth was something of 25 million pounds, and he was estimated to be the third richest man in Britain. According to an FBI file, Stephanie had targeted Rothermore, and it was said that she was reputedly immoral, incapable of resorting to any means, even bribery, to get her ends. They both enjoyed gambling, and she described Rothermore as a fabulous plunger of the casino tables. Hmm. So at this point, to summarize, Stephanie is persuading Rothermore to, in his newspaper, start to write about, let's say, how hard it is to be on the losing side of the war. As the cause of the Treaty of Versailles, she argues, Eastern Europe is strewn with alsace -Lor oh sorry this is not her speaking this was the uh, actual article after she had basically spoken to Rothermore about how hungary should restore its monarchy how terrible it is for austria and germany after the treaty and he writes this eastern europe is strewn with alsace lorraines by severing from france the twin provinces that named the treaty of frankfurt in 1871 made another european war inevitable the same blunder has been committed on a larger scale in the peace treaties, which divided up the old Austrian-Hungarian Empire. They have been created dissatisfied minorities in half a dozen parts of Central Europe, any one of which may be starting point of another confrontation. Here, I'm just going to put up another picture for you. This is uh, Lord Rothermore and Hitler. Lord, obviously, Lord Rothermore is on the left. Just to, what, what you want to take away from this. She's influencing this great uh, newspaper tycoon to write papers sympathizing with Austria to establish the monarchy and to explain why things are quite terrible for everyone in Central Europe because of the Treaty of Versailles, which they're not wrong. There's legitimate grievances here, and the treaty was ruining everyone's lives over there. But you're noticing that she is influencing someone of great importance to write about sympathetic pieces, not just for Austria. This will soon become for the Nazi cause. So I want to just read on ahead. Yes, Rothermore in other pieces calls for the restoration of the Hungarian monarch. He's a, he, he himself is a monarchist, as was most people in Britain, like Churchill, etc. And he is against Bolshevism and the threat of Bolshevism in Europe. So I'm going to skip on ahead. Unknown to Rothermore at this time, MI6 was intercepting Princess Stephanie's correspondence and tracking her movements in and out of the country since 1928. And it seems some information was leaked to journalists in December 1932, and a number of European newspapers had carried allegations of espionage against Princess Stephanie. The French newspaper La Liberté claimed that she had been arrested as a spy while visiting Barretts. It asked the question, is a sensational affair about to unfold. Other newspapers described her as a political adventuress and the vamp of European politics. This seems to be the result of leaks from the, from the French intelligence services. Hmm. MI6 circulated a report stating that French secret services had discovered documents in the princess's flat in Paris, ordering her to persuade Rothermore to campaign for Germany of the territory ceded to Poland at the end of the First World War, where she was to receive 300,000 pounds, equal to 13 million today if she succeeded. This is very interesting. Now we're moving on a little bit further into time with uh, the involvement of Adolf Hitler. Oh, to summarize, uh, I'm sure most of you know that Adolf Hitler takes power in 1933, uh, but prior to that, as is pointed out by, I have the other book, I believe, James Poole's book, Mm -mm -mm. James Poole, here we go. As James Poole brings us up to date, shortly after the Nazi sweeping victory and the election of September the 14th, 1930, Rothermore went to Munich to have a long talk with Hitler, and 10 days after the election, wrote an article discussing the significance of the National Socialist triumph. The article drew attention throughout England and the continent because it urged acceptance of the Nazis as a bulwark against communism. Rothermore continued to say that if it were not for the Nazis, the communists might have gained a majority in the Reichstag. So, what is 
kind of being hinted here. Rothermore is a voice in England. The mediator between Germany and Rothermore is Stephanie. So she's filling Rothermore with all of this stuff. Although Rothermore is a sympathizer, he, he definitely is, and he, he, he's part of all of this, but she is the one that's pushing him. So let's continue. I do have to read a bit here. So, Adolf Hitler becomes official chancellor, 1933. And then a series of articles are produced by Rothermore to boast the regime, say how great it is. The newspaper is obsessed with, as newspapers become obsessed with Nazi violence and racialism, he assures his readers, this is Rothermore, that this should be submerged by the immense benefits that the new regime is bestowing upon Germany. He points out that the criticism of Hitler are mostly by left political spectrum. I urge all British young men and women to study closely the progress of the Nazi regime in Germany. They must not be misled by misrepresentations of its opponents. The most spiteful distractors of the Nazis are found in precisely the same sections of British public and press are the most vehement in their praises of the Soviet regime in Russia. So he's pushing this on the Bolshevism and communist propaganda, which is cute. To go on further, in November 1933, Lord Rothermer uh, <clears throat> gave Stephanie the task of establishing personal contact with Adolf Hitler. Then let us remember, it is probably not known to Hitler or people at this point that she's Jewish, but this is in no way a secret. She is not hiding this. There, She has found out quite early on. But I'll continue. Rothermore uh, speaking to her, telling her to go over. And Stephanie went to Berlin and began a sexual relationship with Captain Fritz Wiedemann, Hitler's personal adjutant. Wiedemann reported back to Hitler that Stephanie was a mistress of Lord Rothermore, and Hitler decided she could be of future use to the government. Da, 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 da. If I haven't already, I should probably put up a picture of her again. Let's use this one. Okay. At the first meeting, Stephanie wore a very elegant outfit, calculating it would impress Hitler. It seemed to have done so, because Hitler greeted her with uncharacteristic warmth, kissing her on the hand. It was far from usual for Hitler to be so attentive to women, particularly women introduced to him for the first time. The princess was invited to take tea with him, and once seated beside him, according to an unpublished memoirs. Hitler scarcely took his piercing eyes off her. This is her speaking, mind you. She handed a personal letter to Hitler from Rothermore, which was a verbal and also a verbal message. Rothermore had said, Remember this day, Hitler. Remember this day. Hitler is going to rule Germany. The man will make history, and I predict he will change the face of Europe. Hitler responded by kissing her hand and presenting her with a personally addressed reply, conveying it directly to Rothermore. So as you can see, she is the meet she's the in-between person carrying messages. Quite precarious. And I must read on. She is Oh, she does a few more of these meetings. Rothermore even gives her a gift to give to Hitler, which is a, uh, a, it's a photograph of the first article he wrote that was about Hitler. And Hitler was delighted by all of this, of course, because why wouldn't he be? And he was, he was very happy that they were delivering the propaganda he sought in England. And he was authorized to give Stephanie about 20,000 Reich marks as uh, payments for her good work at this point. By this time, the British intelligence circulated a note from its French counterparts. Oh, this is the documents we were talking about before from her flat, which were showing the money paid and what her, uh, her missions were. So let's go a little bit more in time. There were several meetings with Lord Rothermore and Hitler. If I can pull up a picture, I believe I, yeah, there they are. Took with him his favorite journalist, okay. Yes, uh, later stages of the First World War. And then there's some uh, dinner parties, and these include Joseph Goebbels, Hermann Goering, uh, Joachim von Ribbentrop, major members of the Nazi party, and Stephanie. So she's invited to these fantastic dinner parties where she's brushing shoulders with more Nazi officials. And the Nazis don't like her because they know, a lot of them know she's a Jew, mind you, but I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. Uh, August 1935, Stephanie was invited by Hitler, along with her friend Ethel Snowden, to attend the Nuremberg Nazi rally. 
She wrote about this, uh, saying it was tribal excitement of Nuremberg, a shrine of Nazi dome, an orgy of dedication to Nazi creed. Snowden wrote an account of the rally. Soon after, MI5, an MI5 agent recorded that Princess Stephanie and Lady Snowden had formed an intimate relationship. So MI5 is following her. A lot of uh, intelligence agencies were. Articles by 1936 in Europe are suggesting that Stephanie is a spy. She returned to Rothermer for advice on how she could clear her name. Rothermer advised her to do nothing about it. It's actually probably smart. That makes sense. He told her that he had been in the newspaper business long enough, and he realized that denial usually resulted in just refreshing the story. So he's just saying, if you don't say anything, it's better. You're better off. Uh, I need to just read on a little bit more ahead. Rothermore has uh, more meetings with Hitler on his return of one of the meetings in 1936, September. He sent Princess Stephanie to Berlin with a pers personal gift to Hitler, a uh, tapestry worth 85,000 pounds today. Oh, nice. With a letter uh, da, 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 da. just saying that Hitler was a great leader. Okay, so she's, she's passing more of these letters on. Now, let us go on a bit further. Hitler was fascinated by Princess Stephanie, and he gave her a magnificent palace, Schloss Leopoldskron, which was confiscated from Max Reinhardt, who was a Jewish guy fleeing from Austria in 1937. I remember this name. I think I have... Do I have a picture of this place? There we go. Ooh, it's still, uh, there we are. It's not very large. Very beautiful place. That's a nice gift, Mr. Hitler. Anyways, man had uh, left in 1937, so she gets this place. And this would be kind of a home base for spy work that she'd be doing. And this is where she would meet with Lord Runciman, who was working for Chamberlain. So this is at the same time that Chamberlain's having discussions with Hitler. And this is, we're getting into the time where uh, the Sudetenland situation, the crisis in Czechoslovakia occurs. She's directly involved in all this. And I will try to summarize this, but it is very, very difficult with how many different articles are being pointed out for this. Okay, okay, I'm gonna go, 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 go down. Uh, there's also an interesting piece here. Here's, a, here's just a memoir from Stephanie during this time. Princess Stephanie was admitted in her unpublished memoirs that her relationship with Adolf Hitler upset those around him because they knew she was Jewish. Every visit of mine to the Reich Chancellery seemed to them an impudent encroachment upon their sacred privileges. And every hour that Adolf wasted upon me was an hour which he might have spent so much greater advantage in their devoted company. His manners are exceedingly courteous, especially to women. At least that is how he has always been towards me. Whenever I arrived or left, he has always kissed my hand, often taking one of mine into both of his and shaking it for a long time <clears throat> to emphasize sincerity and the pleasure of seeing me. As he looks deeply into my eyes, St Princess Stephanie admitted that they were physically intimate, but they were never lovers. She claimed this was because Hitler was a homosexual. Take that with a grain of salt. Excuse me a moment. Hitler's sexuality is somewhat of a fascination. There's a lot of conspiracies about this, but I would argue to you, the viewer, that Hitler mistreated a few women, including his niece, and this was in a sexual manner, which I believe gives credibility to him not being a homosexual. The evidence that he was a homosexual is mostly because he had kept some company with him who were homosexuals. Ernest Throm, of course, is the greatest example. The leader of the SA was a open homosexual, and Hitler had to kill him eventually for it. I might do some, I might do a piece on this later because I found this a fascinating subject. Anyways, needless to say, I don't think uh, Hitler wasn't homosexual. There's very little evidence to support this. We get more now towards her becoming an official Nazi spy. So uh, 1937, on the 25th of November, she arrives to New York City with her new lover, Fritz uh, Wiedemann, and there's a very hostile crowd because they believe her to be a Nazi spy by 1937 in New York. And she brushes shoulders with the German-American Bund, a Nazi front organization, where she brushes shoulders with Fritz Julius Kroon, 
an American citizen who was imprisoned later on for being a agent of Germany. There you go. Uh, she sends a gift to Hitler, a book on American skyscrapers and bridge construction, which he loves because you know he loved architecture, of course. And he show and he writes her very affectionate letters and says how much he praises her for her work, et cetera, et cetera. And the Time magazine of the United States in January 1938 wrote of her, uh, titian-haired 40-year-old Stephanie, confident, a confidant of the Fuhrer and friend of half of Europe's great, is scheduled to sail from England to U.S. this week. Since the fall of Austria, Princess Stephanie, once the toast of Vienna, has lent her charms to advancing the Nazi cause in circles where it would do the most good. As a reward, the Nazi government permitted her to take a lease on the sumptuous Schloss Leopoldskron, the building you're looking at. I just realized I left it up for very long. I'll put her back up. The palace taken over from a Jewish Max Reinhardt after the Anschluss when um, Austria and Germany joined. During the Czechoslovakian crisis, she did yeoman service. They actually use this term, yeoman service, for the Nazi campaign. They're even pointing fingers at the whole Jewish thing right now. Like, it's open. It's very strange. When Mr. Chamberlain sent Lord Runciman to gather impressions of conditions to Czechoslovakia, Princess Stephanie hurried to the Sudetenland castle of Prince Max Hohenlohe, where the British mediator was entertained. So you can see here. She was responsible for a lot of these meetings, and she is responsible, well, not solely responsible, but she facilitated the Sudetenland crisis from being put into Germany's hands. Interesting. It's interesting that she had this influence. She was in the background. She was in the shadows all this time. Think about that when you uh, when you point fingers at Chamberlain. Anyways, we're going to read on. I need to skip quite a bit. There's so much here. She meets, Horing, Go, uh, she meets with Hermann Göring at one point, because Göring is basically saying that war is inevitable and he wants to stop it, and that the only way that he can stop it, because only he can, because it's Göring, he's so important, is to uh, have conversations with the Lord of Halifax. Now that he needs her to help him do this, because he wants to keep this a secret, especially from someone like uh, Joachim von Rippentrop, the German foreign minister, because that guy was... He, he, he probably wanted the war to happen. Um... So she agrees to this, and she sets up a mediation between the Lord of Halifax, and it would not be Goring, I believe it would be uh, with Fritz Wiedemann, her lover probably, who would uh, speak on the behalf. Uh, this fell through. Um, they, the war was inevitable. They could not stop this, but um, it, it's, it's something nice to note that Goring tried to stop the war. We all know that he did, just before World War II, try his best, and then when World War II happened, his life went to hell, and he got addicted to morphine. Or he was always addicted to morphine, but it got a lot worse. Excuse me as I write on. <laughs> okay, so the Daily Herald at this time in July created a storm of controversy. The French government complained that the meeting between Princess Stephanie, there, there were bare, the, the French Secret Service are arguing that she's a Nazi agent at this point. And the Czech ambassador in London is in agreement. If there's any decency in this, as written by uh, the Czech ambassador, if there's any decency left in the world, then there will be a big scandal when it's revealed what part was played in Wiedemann's visit to Stephanie's place. The renowned secret agent, they're calling her out. And a trickster who is wholly Jewish <laughs> today provides the focus of Hitler's propaganda in London. Hit, um, Joseph Goebbels wrote in his diary, Wiedemann's vi visit to Halifax on the Fuhrer's instructions continues to dominate the foreign press more than ever. So it's becoming a bit of a problem now, you're seeing. And note, they're openly saying that she's Jewish. And Hitler will have to, Hitler will have to make a choice uh, eventually. I'm going to try and find it. Um... It says now that Stephanie wishes to put an end to all of the gossip about her and all these foreign papers, but what can you do? She's being outed, basically. On August 1938, the French intelligence, the Deuxième Bureau, told MI6 that it was almost certain that she was an important German agent. And according to MI5, the list of people that she has been associating with over the past few years includes, and this is a great list, the Duke of Windsor, Wallace Simpson, 
Prince George, Duke of Kent. Lady Ethel Soden. Lady Ethel Soden is another Nazi agent, by the way. Philip Henry Kerr, Lord Lothian. Geoffrey Dawson. Hugh Grosvenor, the second Duke of Westminster. Charles Van Tempest Stewart, the seventh Marquis of Lundenberry. Ronald Nalcane, the second Baron Brockett. Lady Maud Cunard. And Walter, Walter Rothschild. Second Baron Rothschild. You heard me right. She was influencing a Rothschild. So all you conspiracy theorists, I'll leave that one to you. MI6 interviewed Stephanie's maid, Anna Stoffel, and the file records. Miss Stoffel is in no doubt Princess Stephanie was acting as a German agent. She lived with her for about a year in this country and traveled with her on the continent. For a time, she had lived with the princess at a castle in Salzburg. Uh, to the place of which many Germans visited, and great deals of talks were made, and there were, and Hitler was involved, and there were interviews with Hitler. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have an agreement there. Uh, the, this article I'm reading now goes into the Munich Agreement, so we're talking about the Czechoslovakia situation where the Sudetenland was taken, and this was influenced by um, Stephanie. So I need to skip on ahead, because this is a very long video, I imagine. Okay, so at one point, it is brought to Hitler's attention, go figure, by uh, Himmler, Joseph, Joseph Goebbels is saying, she's, an, oh, she is a, she's Jewish, what are you doing, Hitler? And Hitler is stating to a certain low, lower man, uh, I don't have his, doesn't have his name, uh, that Hitler agrees that he will have her looked into, and he has the Gestapo researcher, and then he uh, tells them that the Gestapo says that no, she is not in fact Jewish. <clears throat> this is a lie. Hitler has known this for relatively uh, upon meeting her, and he's openly known this. He's just trying to cover for her at this time. But by 1938, things are changing, and you know Hitler is being pressed by people, so he begins to turn against her. And then he's starting to say that he's officially finding out that she's Jewish and such. But he's not really doing anything about it. He even orders her arrest at one point, which he, uh, I think it was, it was Himmler who asked Hitler to do this. Hitler says, uh, oh yeah, she'll be arrested, but he doesn't arrest her. Questionable. Um, Luni Reifenstahl once suggested to Windman the relationship with Hitler becomes more distant because of, his, of her being half Jewish. So people are starting to note that Hitler is having problems with this. According to, oh yeah, I'll bring up her book, Martha Schoed, at this point, the author of Hitler's Spy Princess, Hitler discovered that Weidman was having an affair with Stephanie early in 1939. There was a game of hide-and-seek going on between Stephanie and Weidman, and this had to come to an abrupt end. Hitler found out Weidman was a secret lover, as I just said, why they're repeating themselves. And da, 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 da. Later recalled, I have no use for men such as Viedman in high positions. Okay, so basically, he's he's trying to get Viedman out of the country. So he tells Viedman, take a position as a consul general in San Francisco. You get paid a little bit more. Gives him a raise. Viedman's out of the country. Good. This also gets rid of Stephanie for a while to push her out. Which I'm arguing at this point, he's trying to protect her because he's a personal friend of hers. He's trying to get her out of the country because he knows what's going to start happening. Oh, here we have it. Um, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, Gestapo claims to receive information that she is a secret agent for England. So Himmler's now telling Hitler that she's a double agent. Hitler orders her arrest, as I mentioned, but it's never carried out. Joseph Goebbels wrote in his personal diary that she has become a problem. She has turned out to be a Viennese half Jewess. Her fingers are in everything. Viedemann works with her in a great, in great deal. He may well have thanked her for the present predicament because without her around, we probably would be in a feeble situation with the Czech crisis. So he's acknowledging that she, the, the whole sedate land situation, she she did remedy this. Like she she did good work for Hitler. Okay, just give me a second. MI5 is coming after her by this point. And they're, okay, uh, they believe there's a coup going on. Okay, I need to keep going further. Okay, so at some point, she's in England, and she's going to get deported. MI6 in 1939 tries to deport her. 
uh, and World War II is going to be on its way. Okay, let's, oh, I have to summarize this. This is too much information to give. It's irrelevant. So the outbreak of the war, things are significantly changing. Here, I have a more summarized version. Second World War happens. Princess Stephanie had returned to Britain in 1939. But after the war was declared, she left the country of fear that she would be arrested as a German spy. So she travels to the United States, uh, where <clears throat> she returns to her former lover, Fritz Wiedemann, who was sent by Hitler to be over there in San Francisco. He is the German consul in San Francisco. And upon arrival, the United States places her under the security and surveillance of the FBI. Oh, excuse me, my little bird seems to need its fix. Yeah, choose one. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so in March 1941, she was detained for several days by U.S. immigrant authorities. She made up to Major Leomol B. Schofield, the director of U.S. Immigration and Naturalized Service in Washington, D.C. So he puts her up in a hotel where he lives. So she's obviously sleeping with them. The two carried on an affair that lasted several months, and she she then lived with her mother and son in Alexandria, Virginia. Well, that's interesting. I don't know how that works out. October 1941, the FBI prepared a memo describing her as extremely intelligent, dangerous, and clever, claiming that she is a spy, that she was worse than 10,000 men, summarizing what was known about her. It was recommended that her deportation not be further delayed, and noted that the British noted this to the British and the French. In addition to the United States intelligence community, <clears throat> she had been suspected of being a spy for Germany for a very long time. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the formal entry of the United States into World War II, the FBI arrested her, interning her to a facility in Philadelphia and later a Texas camp for enemy aliens. On January the 10th, 1942, the Enemy Alien Hearing Board in Philadelphia recommended to Attorney General Bidell that she be interned for the duration of the war based on interviews of the previous month. Okay, so then she is, this is when she was caught out. What other information can I give? Uh, there's, it, it's, it's just so long. I don't want to make this video too long, but um, how are we going to look at this whole story? She was a known Jewish princess and a personal friend to Hitler, which is contradictory to everything he was doing. And he was using her. She was using him, honestly, because she was getting into all these places by sleeping with men and getting these various affairs going on, brushing shoulders, using her title, just getting more money. She was like, accumulating a lot of wealth, mind you. And she was trying to play different countries, as you can see with England, the United States. Uh, she was even in France for a long time, in Germany. What an interesting tale this has been. She pushed the agenda for the Nazi machine at the beginning, trying to up the monarch in Hungary and Austria. Maybe she thought she would get a position in this monarch because she was a princess. I think maybe that was her end goal. And that seemed to be what she was looking to do. It was out of convenience for Hitler that she pushed a lot of this propaganda because it, it brought up his cause. She even tried to help Goring stop the war from happening. She was responsible, it seems, for a lot of uh, policies that were put in place, like the Sudetenland crisis. It seems like she significantly helped that go through and unfortunately got Hitler to easily take that over. Looking back at this, it just goes to show the power of one person. Look at her as, basically, I, I keep saying it, James Bond. She could have been a double, I guess she was a double agent in a lot of ways. And she influenced things by just getting in bed with people and telling people to do things and persuading them. She was a femme fatale. We don't hear about her often. She's um, a lesser known uh, figure. But I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about her. And I did it in this informal format because to make a, a full video would have been three videos. And there's a lot more information on her I just simply can't give. I'm trying to summarize this as best as I can. I'm sure this episode's way too long as it is. And I'm sorry for that. I hope you found this interesting. I'm going to do more work like this and find more odd stories. I think the next one I'll do is probably going to be on the weird notion of Hitler's homosexuality since it came up in this article. I'll explain why 
my rationale as to why Hitler probably was not a homosexual and, and why people believe he was because the conspiracy theorists, uh, their evidence is, is terrible. It, it's not very good. Anyways, this has been MBS History. I hope you like this piece. And p please, like I said before, subscribe because obviously, as you can see, my parrot needs more peanuts. It's slowly dying. Let's look at her. Oh, she wants those peanuts so bad. Please subscribe and give us a like. Anyways, this has been MBS History. I'll see you later.